Let's take a look at externalities, environmental policy, and public goods. Economists have some interesting ideas here that you should find helpful. What's the best level of pollution? Is there a way to know what the optimal level of pollution would be? Maybe you, you might say no pollution, but that might be good for the environment, but that would be a serious hindrance on the way that we live, uh, probably very inconvenient for most people. And if, on the other side, though, unrestrained pollution is probably not optimal either. So let's take a look at what economics has to say about all of this. Nobody sets out to create pollution. That's just an unintended consequence of various activities. It wouldn't be such a big deal if it only affected the person who was producing it, right? Then the people would only create pollution until its marginal cost equaled its marginal benefit. But pollution is an example of an externality. So you can think of an externality as a, a side effect, a spillover. It's a benefit or a cost, either one, a benefit or a cost, that affects someone who's not directly involved in the transaction, in the production or consumption of a good or service. So consider electricity, right? We have sellers of electricity and buyers. When firms produce electricity, though, they have cost of production, buildings, equipment, fuel, labor. So that's how they're making their decisions, based on those private costs, the costs that they feel directly. The social cost of this production, though, is higher. The cost of society includes all of those private costs, but also the external cost of, produ of, of the pollution itself. So we can think about this in our familiar now supply and demand framework. All right, so S1 here, it's going to represent the marginal private costs, those, those costs that we thought about, labor, fuel, machinery, those kind of things, right, that the producer of electricity bears. And then we have the demand for electricity that comes from buyers. Supply 2 here includes those uh, the, the pollution there. It might be acid rain, it might be air quality, who knows what, right? So, but the marginal social cost includes those, those public costs that the firm itself does not bear. Okay, so here is our efficient outcome. This is where we would like to be, uh, in this case, with the negative externality, the, quanti the efficient quantity, and the efficient price. So this would be a higher price and a lower quantity. This happens where the marginal private benefit, this demand curve, equals to the marginal social cost. Okay, that, that is different, of course, than what the market actually produces, though, because all the firm faces are these marginal private costs. So we could say that the, the, the market price is too low and the market quantity is too high, and so there would be um, benefits to reducing quantity and charging a higher price, right? That difference here... The difference between the market quantity, market outcome, and the efficient outcome is this triangle here that's deadweight loss. You can calculate the size of this deadweight loss if we knew all these curves. It's just the area of a triangle, right? So one-half base times height. Okay, so when there's a negative externality, remember I said there could be uh, benefits or costs that spill over. So when there's a negative externality, that means that there are costs that spill over. When we have a negative externality, that means that too much of the good or service will be produced at market equilibrium. Equilibrium. That's exactly what we had here. Quantity was too high, the price was too low. So too much was produced with a negative externality. Pollution's the, the classic example of a negative externality. Uh, you could also think about cigarette smoke, okay, something like that. But externalities can also be positive. So these have positive spillover effects, that social benefits that exceed private benefits. So an example of this would be college education. There are positive spillovers to that, like that, right? We like having people around us, colleagues, coworkers who are well-educated, who know what they're doing. Uh, you can think about this as a uh, also vaccines, right? We really would like for other people to be vaccinated so they don't get sick and get us sick. There is a, a positive spillover. So externalities, they're not just negative. They can also be positive. So same idea here. Now we have a private benefit and a social benefit as opposed to a private cost and a, a social cost, right? So this is on the positive side, the positive externality. So we have the benefit received by the consumer and then the total benefit that, uh, that accrues to society that the private actor, the private individual, firm, whatever, does not take into account. So in contrast to negative externalities, positive externalities result in underproduction relative to the efficient level. So if we think about uh, college education here, so this is 
in the supply and demand framework just like before. Notice here, instead of being on the supply curve with supply, you were thinking cost before that was negative. With demand, you're thinking benefit. So here we have private benefit and marginal, and marginal social benefit. So just like before, except now we're on the demand curve. So now we have two demand curves. This size here is that positive externality from college education. Of course, uh, when individuals go and think about the benefits to, to a college education, they're only considering the private benefits. So given that, and given the supply, this would be the market quantity and price. Uh, the efficient quantity, we would actually see, we'd like to see more, uh, a larger quantity here at a higher price. So again, just like before, we have a deadweight loss here. So these are the gains that society would have if we were at the efficient equilibrium, or the they're losses that society gets by not being at the efficient equilibrium. You can think about that either way. So when there is a positive externality, in consuming a good or service, too little of the good or service will be produced at market, market equilibrium. So in either case, positive or negative, uh, we are not at that efficient outcome. There's going to be dead weight loss. A lot of times students have the tendency to think, oh, a positive externality, that's, that's good, that's fine. No, in either case, we're not at that efficient uh, point. In either case, we have dead weight loss. So both of these are examples of market failure a situation in which the market fails to produce the efficient level of output. Remember, we thought about efficiency as where marginal benefit equals marginal cost. And if you account for here with the externalities, marginal benefit is not reaching that uh, marginal social cost in the case of the negative externality, or marginal social benefit is not e equaling marginal cost in the case of the positive externality. So the larger the externality, the greater We'll see, we'll see a greater size in the deadweight loss. And that deadweight loss is a measure of the extent of market failure. So what causes externalities? Typically externalities arise because of incomplete property rights or from the difficulty of enforcing property rights in certain situations. So imagine that a farmer and a paper mill are both on, on this stream. If nobody owns the stream, the paper mill is going to just put pollute the water, right? Making it unusable for the farmer. If the farmer owns the stream, he can prevent the mill from discharging into the stream or allow the mill to discharge some, some acceptable amount of pollution for a fee that they would pay to the farmer. Either way, good property rights avoid this market failure, right? So remember, property rights, they are the rights individuals or businesses have to the exclusive use of their property, including the right to buy or sell it. So if the farmer owns the stream, he can sell some right to pollute, to, to the firm, a, a level of pollution that wouldn't uh, harm the farmer's crops as he waters them or the fish in the stream, anything like that. So is zero pollution efficient? A lot of time we're going to find that some positive amount of pollution is actually optimal, determined by where marginal benefit from pollution just equals the marginal cost, or flipping it around, thinking about it this way, marginal cost of pollution reduction just equals the marginal benefit from pollution reduction. So here's what it would look like. Uh, notice this is reduction here on this axis, the re reduction in pollution, and then the cost or benefit in dollars. So if we were to go past this point where marginal benefit equals marginal cost, so say we're down here at 10 millions of tons in reduction of pollution per year, marginal cost is above marginal benefit. So it's going to cost us to get at this, at this level, 225 it would cost us. Uh, in dollars per ton versus 150. So marginal cost is actually exceeding marginal benefit here. The optimal level, on the other side, we haven't gone quite far enough. The marginal benefit is greater than marginal cost. We could ex we could reduce pollution a little bit farther, right? Uh, so this optimal point is right here in the middle where marginal benefit from pollution reduction and the marginal cost from pollution reduction just equal one another. So if we want to solve this uh, pollution problem, this externality problem, what would be ways we could do this? Uh, Nobel laureate Ronald Coase in this famous theorem you need to be very familiar with. He said that private parties could actually solve this externality problem through private bargaining. So without outside uh, inter interference or influence, if property rights are assigned and enforceable and transactions costs are low. Okay, so and transaction costs, these are just the costs and time and other resources that parties incur in the process of agreeing to and carrying out an exchange of good or go goods or services. So this would be the negotiation cost, basically. 
And the COAS theorem also requires that parties have full information about the costs and benefits involved. What's interesting about COAS's theorem is that it does not matter to whom property rights are initially assigned. So in our example of the farmer in the stream earlier, uh, if the paper mill actually had the rights initially, then it, that would be fine too, so long as the property rights are established and enforceable. In this case, the farmer could pay the paper mill to pol pollute, um, to reduce their pollution to a certain acceptable level. So we've seen there are some circumstances where private parties could come together to internalize an externality. In some cases, it might be necessary for the government to intervene. Uh, we saw in Chapter 4 that taxes cause inefficiency, right? We had that deadweight loss triangle because production wasn't at the efficient level. We see the same thing here with externalities. We have that deadweight loss triangle because of the uh, marginal social cost that is different from the private social cost in the case of negative externality. So we could use a tax of just the right size to account for that, that negative externality. So we'll use a tax to internalize negative externality, and we'll see we use a subsidy to internalize a positive externality. So this is just our standard uh, electricity production example, uh, and there's some pollution that happens in the course of producing the electricity that is factored into the marginal social cost. Okay, so what we're going to do is we want to we want the tax to equal the size of the marginal social cost. So what that's going to do is it's basically going to shift the marginal private cost line up to where the marginal social cost line is. So think about this right here. This vertical distance is the size of the tax. That moves the marginal private cost up to this marginal social cost line. So we actually are going to meet, reach that efficient level of output and that price. Okay, so yep, here's the size of the tax. So now this is the new equilibrium that we're going to e get to through taxation. So now this, notice here all of these different prices here. So this is the price received by producers, just like we did with taxes before. And this is the price paid by consumers. And so this, uh, that vertical distance, like I said, that's going to be the size of the tax. And the size of the tax is determined by the size of the externality. So that the cost of acid rain, that pollution, is equal to the amount of tax imposed by the government. So when there is a negative externality, a tax can lead to the efficient level of output. Yeah, so negative externality is overproduction, so we reduce the output through, ta through taxation. With a positive externality, on the other hand, too little is produced, so taxes don't work, but subsidies might. A subsidy is just an amount paid to producers or consumers to encourage the consumption of a good. So in this case, thinking about subsidizing college education here. Okay, so here's the market equilibrium without subsidy. So this is now positive externality, right? So this is the marginal private benefit. We're going to do the same thing that we did before with taxes, except now on the demand side for a positive externality, we want to increase the market quantity to get to that efficient level of output. So we're going to use a subsidy that is exactly the size of that positive externality. Again, that vertical distance between these curves and subsidizing college education so that we will get to this efficient level of output. So when there's a positive externality, a subsidy can bring about the efficient level of output. There are several alternatives for ta to taxation or subsidizing for solving externalities. You're going to want to read through these and be uh, familiar with them, especially take a look at the cap and trade that's been in the news a lot uh, in the past couple of decades. It's kind of lost in popularity now, but you'll want to read through that and be familiar with that as well. So we've seen that markets are better at providing the efficient level of some goods and services than others. And we have uh, four categories of goods that help us understand that a little bit better based on their characteristics uh, related to being rivalrous and being excludable. So rivalry is when your consumption of the good does, uh, affects another person's consumption of the good. So if you buy a Coke from a Coke machine, um, your consumption affects someone else. No one else can con consume that same Coca-Cola. Same thing here with excludability, or similarly, similarly with excludability, the Coke machine only dispenses Coke to people who actually pay for it. So excludability is a situation in which anyone who does not pay for a good cannot consume it. So here are some examples of these various combinations of being rivalrous and non-rivalrous. You'll want to look through these, have good examples in your mind. Uh, key terms throughout the rest of this chapter you need to know. You need to look at uh, free, being a free rider, tragedy of the commons, and the graphs that are going to go along with this public goods section.